Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Whistler Community Church, we welcome you. Whether you are here in person or you're joining us online, uh, we are so glad you have chosen to worship with us today. If you're out in the foyer, we encourage you to come in and take a seat. Our call to worship this morning uh, begins first with Psalm 46. The psalmist declares that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And in Psalm 94, verses 18 and 19, the psalmist reminds us that God's help is ever-present and very specific to our personal circumstances. For he declares, When I thought my foot is slipping, your steadfast Lord, Love, O oh Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Our opening hymn this morning was written in 1873 by a man named Horatio Spafford, a successful lawyer and businessman from Chicago. Horatio planned to join his friend D.L. Moody on a campaign of evangelistic meetings in Great Britain, and to lift the spirits of his wife Anna and their four daughters, he also planned a vacation for them in Europe. You see, two years earlier, their young son died of pneumonia, and much of their family business was destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire. Detained by business at the last minute, Horatio sent his family on ahead on the SS Ville de Havre, assuring them that he would join them within the week. Four days later into their journey across the Atlantic, their ship was struck by another vessel. The ship sank in the space of only 12 minutes. Tragically, 226 of the 313 passengers on board drowned, including all four of the Spafford daughters. Anna Spafford, Horatio's wife, was among the few that were miraculously saved. While on his journey across the Atlantic only a few days later to reunite with his grieving wife, who is now in England, Horatio wrote these words, When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. What incredible trust Horatio Spafford expressed in the one who loves, guides, and carries us through the storms of life. No matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, can you and I truthfully say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Please stand. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Oh, say 
waits and should buffet through trials should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Lord, haste the day when thy face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, Whistler Church. Thank you. Hold on. <laughs> I'm not as tall. Well, I just want to say what a wonderful event we had yesterday for the rummage sale. Did everybody have fun at that? Thank you, Heidi. That was so amazing to organize that. There was so many volunteers there, and we had so much fun. It, it's just an amazing thing that we're doing here um, in our church with this building. We are, we're forming community and inviting community in. And it's just, it's just amazing how so many people are coming together. And as we serve the Lord and we're uh, tenacious about creating community in, this, um, in Whistler, I'm just so excited that these events are so successful and the Lord just blessed us so well. And I think um, financially, we haven't got the numbers yet, but uh, Young Life has definitely benefited from everyone's generosity. So thank you, everyone that participated in that event yesterday. Uh, we've got quite a few announcements. And um, in case you don't know, next week is Advent. So Christmas is almost upon us here. <laughs> so um, let me get started. First of all, uh, the Whistler Community Dinner, we've decided that will be on Tuesday, December the 14th. It's going to be in the Fellowship Hall across the way, and we've organized um, people to bring items as a potluck style, but the leadership team and other volunteers will be cooking the turkey the main course. So um, we look forward to that. You can sign up online. We'd like people to register so we know what our numbers are, please. And um, there's a list... I'll put it out in this week's newsletter about who brings what, depending on the first letter of your last name. All right, and um, special general meeting is next Saturday, November 27th. And if this is your home church, we invite you to come and be part of the conversation about how we are going to steward this facility for the kingdom of God. 
Uh, is Irene here this morning? No, Irene isn't here. Well, I just want to congratulate and thank Irene for the wonderful job she did with organizing the Samaritan's Purse. There were 30 boxes sent out, and um, it's just a tremendous effort that Irene made, and thank you to everyone that put a box together. Is this sounding funny? No? Okay, sorry. Um, 30 boxes that got sent off to Calgary, that um, our portion of boxes is going to be sent to South America, so to Nicaragua and Guatemala, those countries. So Irene, thank you so much for doing that and everyone that contributed to putting together 30 boxes for Samaritan's Purse. Today is the last day to sign up for Guess Who's Coming for Dinner. We've been announcing it. It's been in the newsletter. It's happening next weekend, uh, Sunday and Monday. We've got plenty of hosts, which is nice, and we need more guests. So who doesn't want to go out for dinner? Please sign up. This is the last day. The sign-up sheets are out by the um, offering box. Thank you. And also, um, Helga's art cards um, are for sale again. We um, had 32 paintings uh, donated to us. Uh, part of Helga's um, wishes were to donate these paintings, and um, we've been selling them for quite a while, but we still have quite a few left. We're reaching out to the Whistler Arts community to see if um, we can have perhaps an art show at Millennium Place or something like that. But her art cards and her art is part of Helga's legacy, and all the proceeds from that are being donated to the church building. So we're coming to the end of that fundraising campaign here. So if you are interested, please see Nell at the front door. And Nell is also um, has the pictures of the art, if you would like to. Uh, purchase one of Helga's original paintings. Wreath making is on December the 1st. That's also been in the newsletter, and there's a slide for that here. So if you're interested in making a wreath, Stephanie's done this for several years. Thank you. And um, it's a wonderful way for us to fellowship together. So if you would like to be part of that, we do need you to pre-register, and it only costs $10. So it's great fun to start your Christmas decorating. And I think that might be all the announcements. Um, one other thing, we put the um, Connect cards out on the chairs this morning. So if you want to be on our email list that gets sent out every week, we need your name and phone number and your email address especially. You can fill that out and you can put comments. We'd love to connect with you if you have any prayer requests. Please fill it out and put it in the offering box. One of the leadership team will get a hold of it and contact you and uh, put your request forward as needed. And um, just a word of scripture I'd like to share this morning from Acts. When Paul was traveling through and doing his ministry, um, he was a learned um, scholar in the word and he preached a lot of old testament stuff to help the pharisees understand the coming of jesus and what that meant to change christianity forever and so this um, verse from acts 13 verse 38 i'd like to share with you therefore my friends i want you to know that though that through the forgiveness of jesus Forgiveness of sins through Jesus is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is set free from every sin and a justification that we were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Let's open the service in prayer, please. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this time together. We thank you that we can meet. We thank you for this wonderful facility that you've provided. We thank you for everything you are doing in the lives of each participant here, Lord. And we pray that uh, this service will be a blessing to you, Lord. We lift up your holy name in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Our next hymn reminds us that it's an incredible privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. What peace we often forfeit and what needless pain that we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. 
Please stand and we'll sing together what a friend we have in Jesus. in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. How oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer have we trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, comfort with the Lord of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. To Friends despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, thou wilt find a solace there. You may be seated. In the upper room on the evening before his arrest and subsequent res re crucifixion, Jesus comforted his disciples by speaking of the Holy Spirit, the advocate or counselor who would never leave them and who would lead them, lead us in all truth. Jesus says to them, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me. But you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. These words of our Lord, recorded in John chapter 14, verses 18 to 20, are the inspiration behind Bill and Gloria Gaither's song written in the last half of the 1960s, Because He Lives. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. 
because I know oh, oh, He holds the future, and life is worth the living just because He lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know oh, oh, he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day, I'll cross a river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. Only a holy God. Pastor John introduced us to this song three weeks ago. So it's time to sing it again. God's holiness is what sets him apart from all other beings, what makes him separate and distinct from everything else. God's holiness embodies his majesty, his greatness, his goodness, and his sinless purity. God's holiness is expressed in his justice. God's holiness is eternal, just as he is eternal. God's holiness ought to move us to revere or fear him and to worship him with awe from the bottom of our hearts. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness tremble? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the Holy God. Who 
What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy. Forever a holy God, come and worship the holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God, come and worship the holy God. Who else could rescue me from my failings? Who else would offer his only Son? Who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy God. Only a holy God. Come back. here to gather and worship uh, the Lord together and uh, now we're going to have our congregational prayer so I, I just pray that you would uh, still your hearts and uh, let's pray together holy God you are holy and you are worthy of all our worship and ad adoration and praise, honor, and glory to your name. Lord, help us to focus on you this day. We love you. We know you love us. And we, we come to worship you. Lord, we love your word. In Micah 6, 8, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what the Lord requires of thee, to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Yes, Lord, we want to do those things. We want to act justly. We want to love mercy, and we want to walk humbly with you. 
We love you. We love your word. And we want to give you all the praise and glory. Lord, um, we lift up uh, all of our relationships with each other here, with our families, in our marriages, our children, our young people near and far studying. Lord, to be with them. And, but first, Lord, we know that our relationship with you uh, needs to be uh, whole. And Lord, we come to you recognizing that we don't always do or say or know the right thing, but, but you do, Lord. And we pray that um, as we seek to be in fellowship with you, Lord, that our relationships with each other can be um, healed through the forgiveness of our sins, through the death of Jesus on the cross. Lord, we come to you and pray that you would help us. That we would forgive each other, to ask for forgiveness when we need to, and that the love and the unity would be shown here for your, for your glory, Lord, in this church. Lord, our hearts are lifted, and uh, we want to pray for those in BC who have been devastated by the floods. Lord, we think of um, the towns of Abbotsford and Chilliwack and Merritt and, and other places, Lord. We think of the transport and the, the roads, Lord, that your hand would be upon all these things and uh, work together um, for the good of the people and that it would be always for your glory, Lord, and that you would show us what we need to do, show us how we can act to love, um, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you as we serve each other. Um, look, yes, we lift up the, uh, the livelihoods of people that have been disrupted and impacted by these floods, Lord. And we pray that you would help and show us how to help. Praise be to God, the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Move our hearts to action, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your gift of young people. Thank you, Lord, for young life and for the rummage sale yesterday and uh, just how... This church opens its doors to the community and we want to love people the way you love them. Um, and Lord, we want to lift up the uh, upcoming meeting, the special meeting, dear Father. And uh, we want to thank you, Lord, for our leaders in this church, that they um, have a heavy load, but with you, Lord, it is light. And we want to um, honor and um, respect and uphold our leaders to you, dear Father. And there are different kinds of gifts, but the, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working but the same God works all of them in all men. 2 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. Lord, show us um, in this body 
dear Father, that we are all part of this body and that you have a plan and a purpose for each of us here in Whistler. And we thank you for this, this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Mia, would you like to come up now and read our scripture for us, please? Today's Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 6, verse 24 to 34. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It is not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if so God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and the Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But first, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to invite the Sunday School children up now, please. And while they're on their way up, um, just another announcement about the leftover donations from the rummage sale. We've got quite a bit there. So if um, everyone could help by taking some of the items that are left over uh, to the Re Use It Center or the Rebuild It Center. And if anyone's going to the city, uh, sorry, if anyone's going to the city, um, our Reuse It Center doesn't take books, so instead of throwing them in the garbage, we would love if someone could take the books to the city, to a facility down there where they can be reused. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, let's pray, you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you um, for each child here and the families they represent, Lord. I just thank you that it is not an accident or mistake that they're here today, Lord. Um, we just thank you that today we will be reminded of your sovereignty, God, that you are in control, and may we all um, allow that to penetrate our hearts. Um, yeah, be with us as we learn more about you, and God, just uh, help us to um, continually submit our will and way to you, God. I just thank you for the privilege and honor it is to um, walk alongside these young people. Um, yeah, what a joy it is. In your name I pray. Amen. Are we good? Yeah, there I am. Uh, if you're visiting with us, my name is John. I, I'm one of the pastors here, and we're doing a sermon series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. 
And so today I want us to begin by just focusing on this one phrase that Mia read, where Jesus says this, do not be anxious about your life. So Jesus is teaching his followers, this, this gathering of people uh, in front of him on the hill overlooking the, the, the Sea of Galilee, and he's teaching you and me that when we live under the reign of God, when we're a part of his kingdom, anxiety shouldn't be in the picture. When God's in the picture, anxiety is not in the picture. That's the key idea here. And so, in a way, the Jesus is putting the question to us, does your life align with the fact that you are in the care of the creator of the universe, that this creator is all good and all knowing and all powerful, and this creator relates to you the way a parent, a father relates to his child? Is, does that factor into how you see the world, or are you functionally an atheist? Are you functioning as if God is irrelevant to all the situations that you're worrying about? You might say that you believe in God, that you believe the gospel, that you might believe certain truths, but when it really comes down to it, you truly believe that you're on your own. And that no one is there to help you. Now, before I say Uh, get into the text too much further, I do want to say something about anxiety and anxiety disorders. Um, Because not all anxiety is sinful, right? And we need to be aware of that as we're thinking about this and as we want to help each other. And and the first thing I want to point out is that a certain kind of fear, a certain kind of anxiety is helpful and it is a God-given response to protect us from harm, right? So like vigilant avoidance of salmonella or e coli um it is is a healthy thing david and i had to do our food safe course last month so you're welcome um i i hope that when we have potluck meals and when you you know go for coffee or whatever that no one gets sick because we're we're on it um panic is a useful response when your house is burning down that's not necessarily a time that you want to just be chill and see what happens In Scripture, we're told the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? So there is a a kind of fear and anxiety that is completely warranted by the situation, and it's not discouraged, and it's not sinful. The second thing I want us to know is that uh, there are factors which create anxiety in a person which are not necessarily an act of the will. It's not a matter of choice, and therefore it's not right to call it sinful. Two years ago, we did a a sermon series called Body, Mind, Spirit, where we talked a lot about different kinds of mental illnesses, and we talked about how our physical brains, our hormones, and and other factors like sleep and diet, these interfere with our ability to think and feel and make good decisions. And so, to some extent, anxiety might be uh, beyond a person's control. And so if we're, we're trying to help one another out, we need to be aware of this, that there might be something physiological, something neurochemical going on, and if we're just trying to deal with only uh, the, the mental and the spiritual um, without recognizing that people are whole people, we're this unity of body, mind, and spirit. We're, we may not be helping them, right? Like, uh, I have terrible Wi-Fi in my house, okay? It's, it's always been that way. I've been through two different internet service providers, and we've, we've spent a lot of time on the phone running through troubleshooting steps. And um, unfortunately, I have not yet gotten to the point where I can get a technician to come to my house. What I, what I really need is someone to come and hardwire multiple Wi-Fi hotspots in my house because the signal just, it ain't gonna go through the walls. But every time I call my unnamed service provider, they want to go through their whole troubleshooting tree trying to tweak whatever they can remotely to get it to work. And I'm just like, you know what, guys? Software isn't going to change the laws of physics. Like, someone actually has to come to my house and hook up a wire. And until that happens, you're just wasting my time. 
And sometimes when someone is struggling with an anxiety disorder, that's how it can feel. It can feel like a waste of time. It can feel I insulting because until those connections in their brain can be dealt with, um, that you're not going to actually help all that much. The thing is, Jesus doesn't just say, don't be anxious, full stop. Jesus is a little more nuanced than that. And I'm going to argue that Jesus is not interested in chastising people for things that are beyond their control. Why would I say this? Well, let's look at how this, this verse is translated in our ESV Bible. Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life. What is the verb there? The verb is be, right? It's what you are. You are anxious. Um, is that really what Jesus is going after or is he going after something else? And uh, the old King James Version puts it a different way. It, it's slightly different. The word is, or the, the phrase is, take no thought for your life. Take no thought. The verb there is about what you choose to set your mind on. Where do you focus your thoughts? What, what kind of thoughts do you indulge? What do you dwell on? Right? Because we have a choice about how we think. And that's what Jesus is going after. His challenge to us and to everyone who lives under his reign is to make intentional choices about which thoughts we entertain, which facts we bring into the equation when we're looking at our situation. Does our status as children of God factor in or are we functionally living as if we're on our own? We're accountable for this, not our brain chemistry. Third thing I want us to recognize is that all of us are going to struggle with worry, but it can look very different for different individuals. Not all of us are going to struggle in the same way. And, and D.A. Carson gives a brilliant illustration, which I have uh, tweaked slightly, but I just want you to see if this resonates, okay? So I want you to picture three people, and, and I'll just say, uh, all resemblance to actual persons is purely incidental and for dramatic purposes only. I'm not... This is not about any one of you. This is about all of you and me. Okay, so first person, happy-go-lucky, free spirit, chill dude. Let's call him Bodhi. He rarely gets anything done, and he never does anything on time. He doesn't worry about the next five minutes, let alone tomorrow. Responsibility is not in his vocabulary. At church, he will help out if he is specifically asked but everything in his life has to pass through the filter of, do I feel like it right now? Which means he will not commit to something tomorrow or the next day or the next month because he doesn't know if he will feel like it. So he wants to keep all of his options open. He is allergic to conflict. And therefore, everyone knows him as a nice guy because he will not get into a disagreement with any, anyone. On the other hand, He's not particularly sensitive to the feelings of others because no one really gets the sense from him that he actually cares about anything. And he never allows his mind to go down the rabbit hole of thinking about the implications of the people around him for life apart from Christ. The kingdom of God is something that's great for him, but he doesn't think about what it might mean for others. Second person is hyper-responsible. Let's call her Jane. Jane takes, <laughs> Jane takes everything seriously, every grief, every burden, is 10 out of 10 on the seriousness scale. If there's any prospect of trouble, she frets over it, so much so that her body experiences all kinds of psychosomatic uh, issues of, of stress, right? The decline of society is a constant weight on her mind. Not only does she worry about tomorrow, she is living in constant fear that one day, one day the shoe is going to drop and her life will be over. And actually, the more she thinks about it, if that happened quickly and suddenly, that would be great. But her, her greatest fear is that her life will just be death by a thousand paper cuts and one by one, every good thing in her life is just going to fall apart. 
and she will be left alive, but utterly, utterly broken. Her fear feeds on itself. As people can't handle the constant negativity and the constant suspicion, and so they pull away, which leads her to feel isolated and unsupported, and confirmation bias kicks in, and she goes, I knew it. Nobody cares about me. Jane's life is never-ending damage control. Third person is a middle-aged man known for his integrity and his hard work, and let's call him George. George wakes up one night to discover that his wife can't speak and she can't move on her right side. A brain tumor is discovered, but major surgery proves useless. The doctor tells him that his wife's recovery period will be lengthy and she will not be the same person. She will not have the same strength. She will not have the same mental clarity. And in fact, the prognosis is three years, during which time she will become more and more like a vegetable, and then she will die. D.A. Carson writes, These three people, here some preacher used Matthew 25, 6, 25 to 34 as the basis for a long sermon on the wickedness of worry. The preacher says, That worry involves distrust in God, and this is shameful. How will each react? Bodhi? Bodhi is stoked. Why? Because he always knew everyone else was always way too uptight. Why get so hung up with binding commitments? He is happily and free and cheerfully obeying the Lord's injunction to not worry. Jane? Jane is crushed by this sermon. She feels herself directly in the crosshairs of Jesus' words. She worries that she has been denying the Lord and despairs of her inadequacies and her sins. And quite without any sense of irony, Jane begins to worry deeply about how much she worries. George, George listens to the sermon and he puts on a brave face. He nods. He also Bunders under under his breath, something to the effect, this preacher should watch his own wife die before venturing on a difficult subject like this. And George is is feeling a little tired and a little vindictive, so he begins checking off a, a long list of other things that people might jolly well be legitimately worried about. Climate change, the threat of war with China, the mutation of the virus, racial racial prejudice, the erosion of rights, toxic political polarization. He may also then move on to problems a little more close to him, his friend's marriage is falling apart, the incompetence of his young and naive manager at work, family feuding, rebellious teenagers, and so on. And these personal frustrations and enmities somehow coalesce with these bigger worldwide concerns because they are all constantly being deposited in his brain by a relentless news feed coming to him from his electronic devices. Not worry. George hears this injunction. He weighs it against the gnawing anxieties which plague his spirit and endanger his wife's health, and he mutters, you don't understand. It can't be done. How could anyone be so naive? Which one of these three is you? How will you respond to the words of Jesus today? I want us to walk through what Jesus says, Then we'll talk a little bit about how we can respond and how we can help one another respond to Jesus' words and take them on board. So let's begin by by looking at, at, uh, starting at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, and we'll just take it one step at a time. And the first thing Jesus says is that worry is incompatible with worship. So Jesus has been talking about money, and and we talked about that for the last two weeks, and, and now he's talking about anxiety, but... This is not a shift in topics. These things are intimately related. 
Look at verse 24. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, right, these things are linked. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And I don't think it's, it occurs to us that anxiousness about some basic needs can be linked with greed. Right? We want greed to be about all those people who have more than us and their preoccupation with the excesses that they bring into their life. We don't think that our anxiety is any way like their greed. But Jesus is showing something here. He's saying, the point at which you are captive to the thought that serving the kingdom of God and giving to the kingdom of God is unrealistic and it's unpractical, you are enslaved to a false god. You are living under its power. You cannot worship God and dismiss his word as being unrealistic. Those two things don't go together. Second thing he says is worry is dehumanizing. Verse 25, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? You know, I used to live next to a guy who had a Shelby Cobra, nice car. Um, he would be tuning it until three in the morning sometimes, and that, that was really loud. Um, he spent a lot of time on maintenance, and in the seven years that we lived in that house, I maybe saw that car on the road once. Point is, it is possible to devote your life entirely to maintaining your existence and yet never actually live. Or in the case of worry, maybe it's not maintenance but simply damage control. You're always putting out fires but you're never actually alive. And that's not what you were made to be and that's not what you were made to do. Right? You were made to do more than just exist. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? We were created to do something, not to just stay alive. Third, worry overlooks God's care. Verse 26, Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, of not more value than they? Jesus says, look at creation, right? Don't you see that God is constantly filling this world with good and beautiful things, and he is sustaining and caring for all of it? He takes good care of stuff, Right? Yes, this world is cursed and, and death and decay are a part of the picture. And yet, despite that, there's, there's beauty and there's life everywhere. Sometimes despite human beings' best efforts. Jesus says, remember that you were made in the image of God. Plants and animals are good things, right? The beauty of creation, this is all good. But none of those things bear the image of God. You bear the image of God. So how could you think that God has somehow forgotten you or he's neglecting you? You were made to be his workmanship, the centerpiece of all of creation. Fourth, worry doesn't actually help. Verse 27, And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Jesus literally says, which one of you can add a foot to your life? Like as if our journey, you know, is, is, is thousands of miles, the, the, the length of our life, and we think that we could add just one more foot onto that journey by worrying. And that's a hard one for us because I think we believe that we can add clock to our, to the, or we can add time to the clock by worrying. As I said before, vigilant avoidance of salmonella, it does a body good, Right? And Jesus isn't telling us that we shouldn't be careful, you know, that we should go up on the mountain and just go full sand off a cliff. No, he's not saying that. He's reminding us that if we think that we can beat death, we're kidding ourselves. So why trade away the time you have 
Why be paralyzed by worrying instead of living? Have you ever known someone who has a, a terminal prognosis? Like, I, I, granted, not everyone uh, who does finishes well. But I have known some who have finished very well. They, they, the way which they live puts the rest of us to shame. They, they, they make peace. They settle their accounts. They hold nothing back in loving and serving and sharing the gospel with others. And they waste no time being preoccupied with stuff or with petty little squabbles. Like, if you found out that you had three or six or 12 months to live, how would things change for you? There's a quote that's often attributed to Dr. David Jeremiah. I don't think it came from him, but good enough. And it goes something like this. He says, The man of God, or the woman of God, in the will of God, is immortal until such a time as God calls him home. What would it look like to live as an immortal? What would it look like to know that until the moment God has ordained that you should go to be with him in glory, that you are immortal, that you are invulnerable. You know what? That's how Jesus lived. My wife and I have watched the, 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 the TV series The Chosen since it first came out. One of the things that kind of struck me as I was watching was just like how upbeat and, and happy uh, Jonathan Rumi's portrayal of Jesus is. Um, I don't know if that struck anyone else. I guess I always thought like, okay, Jesus knows he's going to the cross. He's constantly telling his disciples, you know, I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be buried and on the third day I'm going to rise again. So is he living in constant terror of that? He, it doesn't seem that he is. It seems that he is living in just delight in doing God's will. Jesus is a happy person. Bible scholar Tom Wright says this, Jesus had a strong, lively sense of the goodness of his Father, the creator of the world. His whole spirituality is many a mile from those teachers who insisted that the present world was a place of shadows and gloom and vanity, and that true philosophy consisted in escaping it and concentrating on the things of the mind. His teaching grew out of his experience. When he told his followers not to worry about tomorrow, we must assume he led them by example. He wasn't always looking ahead anxiously, making the present moment count only because of what might come next. No, he seems to have had the skill of living totally in the present, giving attention totally to the present task, celebrating the goodness of God here and now. If that's not a recipe for happiness, I don't know what is. So as, you, as you face, you know, the challenges of life and the things you worry about, like, ask yourself, what, what would it look like to have the mind of Christ about this situation? How would Jesus have handled it? Fifth, worry is unbelief. Look at verse 28. And why are, are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? Now Jesus is making two illustrations here. First he says, you guys have to recognize God does beautiful work, right? If he does good work making flowers beautiful, do you think he, he, he cares about making your life a thing of beauty? Second, he says God cares for the grass. But listen, the grass is temporary. It's only here for a moment. But you, you are made to be eternal. So why do you think he wouldn't invest his care in you. It, it, it's pretty combative language, right? And then he throws this at them, oh, you of little faith. Why does he say they are of little faith? Why does he accuse us of being little, of little faith? 
Well, it's because we are refusing to see God for who He is. We are refusing to accept the fact of His character. Theologian Sam Storms writes, Worry is an expression of lack lack of faith in the character of God. When we worry, we doubt His goodness. We don't believe that He wants to help. When we worry, we doubt His greatness. We don't believe that He is able to help. Worry says, God, either you are wicked or you are a wimp. And I haven't decided yet. But in any case, you aren't worthy of my trust. Sixth, worry is the hallmark of life outside the kingdom of God. Look at verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. Now, this isn't actually about race or ethnicity. This is about drawing a contrast between people who live in knowledge that God loves them and God is caring for them and people who don't know God at all. And this is really getting to the heart of the passage. It's that question we asked at the beginning. Is Does your life align with the fact that you are in the care of the creator of the universe and this creator is all-powerful and all-good and all-knowing and this creator relates to you as a loving father? Or are you functionally an atheist? Because listen, if there is no God, there is no guarantees. Nobody has your back, right? Life out there only exists as an accident and it's survival of the fittest. And guess what? You may not be the fittest. Now, you can live in a certain kind of nihilistic ignorance that says, hey, you know what? Nothing really matters, so I can do whatever I want. You know, no regrets. Live for today. YOLO, right? It's a bliss. It can, it can be a blissful ignorance, but it is a tremendously fragile ignorance. It's fragile because the wealth that keeps the party going, that is fragile. Our health is fragile. Our relationships are fragile. And we know that. And once the cracks begin to form, what choice do we have but to worry? Now, people can do all kinds of things to try and and, and mitigate the symptoms of worry, right? You can do yoga, and you can do breath work, and you can do meditation, and you can Try and detach yourself from your desires. But what you can't do is change the fact about what's coming down the pipeline. That you have a date with extinction that you cannot move. You cannot change the facts that fuel your worry. But if you are living in the kingdom of God, You have a fact that you must account for. A fact that makes worry not necessary. And that is that, yes, we do have someone to rescue us. Worry is not necessary. Someone does have our back. Look at verse 32. Your heavenly Father knows you need them all. Once again, Jesus reminds us that God has the power to attend to every one of our needs. Like, there's nothing that's going to stump him. There's nothing that's going to overcome him. And is he interested? Yes, he's our father. He loves you. Like, he really loves you and he cares about you. He is for you. Eighth, we need something more than worry. And this is the, uh, the very famous verse, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If you grew up in the church, you're probably hearing the song in, our, in your head right now. And it's familiar, but it's also very counterintuitive, isn't it? Because we like to tell ourselves that, well, yes, we know that seeking the kingdom is something we should do. It is something we should prioritize, but... We got stuff to sort out first, right? We got matters to attend to right now. And and maybe, you know, maybe once the debt's paid, maybe once things are straightened out at work, maybe once we get some relationship statuses sorted out, then we can focus on that thing. But right now, 
damage control, right? But Jesus is saying, no, 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 you don't understand. You seek first the kingdom, and then all those things are given to you. Jesus takes what we would consider our common sense, and he turns it on his head. As C.S. Lewis puts it, he says, aim at heaven and you get the world thrown in. Aim at the world and you get neither. So how do we put all these eight principles together and live it out, right? Like, how does that look for us? As I mentioned, depending on your, your situation in life, what you're going through, and on your temperament, this can look like a few different things. So let's go back to our three people, Bodhi, Jane, and George. Now, every word that Jesus said applies to all of them. But let's talk a little bit about how it looks for each. Let's talk about Bodhi. Bodhi needs to recognize that he is actually a very anxious person, right? Like so many man-children out there, he thinks that he's courageous because he doesn't get tied down by commitments, but he is terrified, terrified of commitments. His anxiety is, is a mask that he uses to hide the fact that he is afraid of attachment to anything. Nothing matters to him because he's afraid that once something starts to matter, he is vulnerable to disappointment and frustration, and he might fail. Once he cares about something, he might also be in conflict with someone, right? Someone that he disagrees with. But you know what? That's okay. Jesus was in conflict with a lot of people who disagreed with him. But Jesus lived a life that mattered. He was invested wholly in doing his Father's will and loving others, and he was not afraid to do any of that. Bodhi needs to be reminded that he was created for a purpose. And as long as he's not getting tied down, he's not committed to anything, he is not living for a purpose. He needs his brothers and sisters to relentlessly pursue him and and drag him along to serve alongside him and actually get involved in something that matters. Jane, Jane needs to recognize that her anxiety doesn't actually serve her very well at all. She needs to hear and meditate on Jesus' words in Matthew 6.34. Jesus says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble, right? You try to take on everything that might happen ever, you're going to get crushed. But God will give you enough strength to handle today's worries. Alexander McLaren explains this passage well. He says this, What does your anxiety do? It does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. It does not make you escape the evil. It makes you unfit to cope with it when it comes. It does not bless tomorrow. It robs today. For every day has its own burden. Sufficient for each day is the evil which properly belongs to it. Do not add tomorrows to today's. Do not drag the future into the present. The present has enough to do with its own proper concerns. Listen to this. We will always have the strength to bear the evil when it comes, but we have not strength to bear the foreboding of it. As thy day, so shall thy strength be. In strict proportion to the existing needs will be the God-giving power. But if you cram and condense today's sorrows by experience and tomorrow's sorrows by anticipation into the narrow round of the one twenty-four hours... There is no promise that as that day thy strength shall be. God gives us the power to bear all the sorrows of his making, right? But he does not give us the power to bear the sorrows of our own making, which the anticipation of sorrow most assuredly is. As Jane begins to make conscious decisions about how she directs her thoughts, what she focuses on. She will need 
her brothers and sisters to constantly and sometimes annoyingly turn every anxious thought into a prayer. Instead of saying, I can handle my situation, I can control the damage by just thinking about all the different ways that my life can get messed up. Every concern you take to the Lord in prayer. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast your anxiety on Him, for He cares for you. And the image here is of having a heavy burden on your back and literally throwing it onto someone else. And the beauty here is that you don't have to say, ah, it doesn't matter, right? You don't have to say, well, the problem is that things matter to me. I, I, am, I have attachments. You know, Jesus didn't teach that kind of Zen detachment from things. No, he cared very much about people. He cared very much about the world. He wants us to care about things, but he does not want us to carry what only he should carry. He says, cast your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. And this is an, an exercise in conditioning our reflexes, right? You know what conditioned reflexes are? They're, they're things that don't, you're not born with an automatic ability to do, but as you do it through repetition over and over again, it becomes automatic. It's like brushing your teeth. Like, I gotta say, folks, like, if you need to be told to brush your teeth, something's not going so well for you, and life will not go well for you. But when it becomes an automatic thing that every morning, every evening, you brush your teeth, you take good care of yourself. We need to be trained. We need to train ourselves to constantly be taking all these worries and anxieties and turning them into prayers so that we can live. We're not a menace to ourselves. We're not a menace to others, which also applies to brushing your teeth. So what about George, right? George hears this passage. He hears over and over again, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. He believes it is possible theoretically that God could heal his wife. He also realizes there's a very real possibility that he won't. And George is scared. What does George need? He needs, George needs to know that this is not a moralistic lecture telling him to smarten up, right? Not, Jesus isn't telling him to just do better. First of all, as far as we're concerned, George needs his brothers and sisters to surround him and his wife and just love on them and weep with them and grieve with them and pray with them. George needs to call on the power of the Holy Spirit to work in his heart, in his, in his wife's heart, so that even when the darkest days come, they know that they're not alone. That they know and, and feel in a very tangible way that they are loved and that no matter what happens the goodness and the mercy of God will be with them all the days of their life and that when they need it there will be a peace that passes understanding there for them when they come to him they also need to be reminded that this same Jesus who says, don't worry, didn't say this in isolation from the pain and hardness of life because he lived it himself. He was born into poverty. He experienced rejection. He experienced the grief of losing people he loved. Jesus does not ask George to walk where he has not already walked first. Jesus does not Ask George, George's wife to walk where he has not already walked first because he has walked into death. And Jesus promised that in this world we will have trouble. And the world brought Jesus trouble. The world's troubles did their absolute worst on Jesus, but 
he overcame the world. The worst case scenario, it happened to him. But George and George's wife can know that nothing can separate them from the love and the goodness of God because Jesus lives. He was not defeated by death, and nor will they be. And because he lives, they can face tomorrow and the next day and the next day, one day at a time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. I thank you that we can call you Father. We can know that you are able and you are willing and you are loving and you are always seeking after our greatest goods. And Lord, you desire that we should live our lives free of the worry that sucks the life out of us, but that we should be free to seek your kingdom, to live out those purposes that you've prepared for us, that we should walk in them. And that we should stand together and support one another on the way. Lord, I pray for all the Bodies and Janes and Georges here. Lord, that we would not harden our hearts and say, yeah, but you don't understand my situation, but we can rest assured that you, you know every single situation each of us are in. And in calling us to obedience, you are calling us into life. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor John, for being God's mouthpiece. <clears throat> you and I are brought into God's kingdom by grace through a personal faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. God's kingdom spreads as every aspect of our life is joyfully and freely surrendered to the one who has rescued us. And that means giving God first place. First place in our, in our personal morality, in our free time, in our finances, in our professional life, in our home, our marriage, and our family. It means giving God first place in terms of our future and our spheres of influence. To seek first the kingdom of God is to personally commit to spreading the life-changing good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Our closing song is drawn directly and appropriately from today's sermon text. Seek ye first. Please stand. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Scottish.
shall be given unto you. Seek and he shall find. Walk and the Lord shall be unto you. Thanks for being with us here this morning. Our benediction is from Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.